Hello, this is your host, Todd Lewis of the Praise of Folly podcast. Today I'm joined by, uh, should I call you Dr. David Friedman? or what's I don't name? care. You don't care? Okay, yeah. David Friedman. Thank you so much uh, for, for joining me today, uh, Mr. Friedman. Glad to be here. You have an interesting topic. I, well, it's one that you like a lot and one that I've thought about a lot, too. Um, I think one thing that, that would be interesting maybe to start with is you had your, um, I guess, debate with, with Holcomb uh, some, some years ago. And, and you were talking about the different, con- and whether the state was inevitable, whether it would arise inevitably from these forces. Um, and, and one of the things that, that obviously comes up or no, sorry, you brought it up. He, he said he ignored one of uh, the objections to you that you had answered somebody else make. Um, I, and I think it had to do with the, uh, I want to say had to do with the, the corporations turning against their, uh, the people that they paid for. But you didn't elaborate on that in the context of that debate. I don't know if you remember that. I don't. I'm afraid I don't remember this particular exchange. Oh, that's, okay. I, I, I listened to part of, of, of one of your debates on this mm-hmm. subject, and I thought the person on the other side was trying to make much too strong a claim that you are correct, that uh, national defense raises a public good problem, and that we can expect public goods to be underproduced. On the other hand, underproduced doesn't mean not produced. There are quite a lot of public goods that do get privately produced. Uh, Furthermore, there is no reason to expect governments to do optimal things. That what's really going on is that for most issues, for producing food or education, we have good reasons to expect the market to get it about right. We don't have good reasons to expect the government to get it about right. And that's a strong argument for the market. In the case of national defense, we don't have good reasons to expect either system to get it right. So you're really talking in a sense about kludges, about imperfect ways of solving the problem. And whether those turn out to be adequate is going to depend on both sides of the equation, as it were. On the one hand, how how large the threat is, that there are some countries, I believe it's the case at present that Costa Rica has no army. I'm not sure that's right, but I think that's right. But there were certainly some countries at some times, let us say, uh, the the Czech Republic in 1938 or so, Mm -hmm. which are facing an enormously powerful opponent and very likely with neither anarchy nor government are going to defeat them. Mm -hmm. There are other situations where there's no serious threat. Uh, Despite a lot of talk, the U.S. is in one of those situations at present that the U.S., our only geographical neighbors are Mexico and Canada, neither of which is an aggressive, uh, powerful uh, opponent. Uh, the potential enemies are really enemies mostly because uh, we have a fairly aggressive foreign policy and it intersects with theirs in various unpleasant ways. So I don't think the U.S. is a great threat. On the other hand, if you have a society that's rich and completely defenseless, it's obviously going to be very tempting for other people to try to try to attack it. And the so that's one half is how big the threat is, and the other half is how well the various imperfect mechanisms work. That one of the things that struck me listening to your earlier debate was that you seem to be assuming that a libertarian anarchist society would be inhabited by ideological libertarians. And that's not very likely uh, mm-hmm. any more than our society is inhabited by ideological statists, whatever that means. Uh, that most people are conservative in the sense of taking for granted the institutions that they're living with. Uh, there's a short story you may have read by Werner Vinja, The Ungoverned, which is about the invasion of a stateless society by an adjacent state. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I like about the story is the way in which the people on each side of the conflict take their institutions for granted and Mm -hmm. then misinterpret the other side in terms of their institutions. There's a, it would take too long to summarize the story, but it's sort of a a neat pattern. So so I think you want to assume an anarchist society where people aren't very different from what they are now. Mm -hmm. And then there are a lot of things that will determine it. To take the extreme case, Afghanistan, has over the last, what, 300 years, two or 300 years, uh, 
put up an enormously effective defense against three of the world's most powerful uh, empires uh, pretty successfully without really a government to do it. That happens to be a society where the social institutions are such uh, that the people are good at fighting, have institutions to do the fighting and so forth. And I can imagine other societies that would go the other way around. <laughs> so anyway, there are a bunch, of, a bunch of variables that go into how good an imperfect job a, a, a state or society can do in defending itself. Now let me give, let you say something. Sorry, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to interject that what would be the assumption, all of those are very good points. Now as far as the idea that a libertarian society would be full of ideological libertarians, um, this, this kind of gets down to the differences between your libertarianism and the Austrian Mises libertarianism. Mm. They're very sort of deontological first principles. Yes. So I was sort of assuming uh, their version and mm -hmm. sort of being uh, saying, okay, so if you're going to argue for X, this is what they want it to be. Yes. And so I was I was merely assuming for the sake of that debate their terms. I, I mm. didn't want to have to haggle over definitions and, mm. and things like that. But you're absolutely right. Most people in a libertarian society, even today, would be would be conservative. I mean, we, we see this even with the Mises Institute itself. It, it's run by Catholics, you know, Lou Rockwell and, and many others. So we, we do see this. Uh, Consider on the other side of it, the central assumption of worry about global warming is the conservative assumption that change is bad. That people spend lots of time arguing about is global warming happening, is it due to humans? Very little time thinking about whether the net effects of global warming are good or bad. Mm -hmm. Although about three minutes thought ought to convince you that it will have both good and bad effects, and that therefore it's not obvious whether the net effect is bad. Oh, exactly. Um, I think I think one thing that you you did get at early on in this discussion, I think, might be uh, comparing uh, services being provided more or less well. There's no there's no perfect provision of a service, mm -hmm. and so when we talk about whether service should be provided publicly or privately, there's, I think, two things that are involved here. Even if you could demonstrate that a service could be produced privately at at least the same competitive rates as it is publicly, uh, that isn't the only thing you'd need to prove to recommend it as a policy decision. So, for example, um, the fact that security can be provided privately has been shown historically to happen. An example would be the late Roman Republic. Marius, Sulla, Caesar, Pompey, you could argue were private security contractors, if you will, to use a modern parlance. Well, they were in fact commanding a national army. All the people you were, well, Pompey, it's a little complicated because yeah. it's civil war by then. But Marius and Sulla were both Roman generals yeah. uh, having official command over troops. Uh, so I, I, I'm not sure that that, that, that context uh, is, is all that interesting. My standard example on the other side for private production of military offense is the Norse armies that ravaged Anglo-Saxon England. Yes. That as far as I can tell, those were entrepreneurial projects where somebody who had the reputation of being a good military leader got a whole bunch of people together and said, look, let's invade England. Either we can grab some land or they'll pay us to leave. The East uh, India companies as well are a good example of. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but but, but that, the, the point that I was getting at was the a, a national army, n not always the case, but typically let's look at the Roman, the early Roman Republic when it was a, when it was a national uh, army where we, you know, the farmers were recruited. The idea of using the army as a bludgeon against the subject was very rarely done. It became yeah. it became normative once it was professionalized. Uh, Nick continues all along and through the empire. And so you have a, a, a more privatized or more or less privatized system. But what it does is it, it, it well, it is effectively producing the good. There's externalities that are tied onto it that it's not uh, conscious or reflective of the issues of the needs of the people. And powerful uh, operators can then use those devices. And you mentioned the Vikings, in the, and I mentioned the East India Company. They did the same thing. They're not. Whereas if you raise an army from your own people, think of like <clears throat> the army raised by Alfred the Great to drive out the Saxons, the Vikings rather, that army was of the English people itself. So in that case, <coughs> it's less likely to be used as a force of oppression, of, of uh, internal That's, oppression. That, that, it seems to me, was the original, part of the original argument for the Second Amendment. 
I'm not sure how well it works now, but I think the original argument, as I take it, was that looking at the history of England in the 17th century, it was clear both that a professional army could generally beat an amateur army and that a professional army was very dangerous. <coughs> as you know, there were two English civil wars, and the first English civil war was basically the king and a bunch of various factions against parliament and a bunch of various factions, and parliament won. And the second English Civil War was Oliver Cromwell and the New Model Army against practically everybody else. And Oliver Cromwell won, and he was military dictator of England for the rest of his life. And I think that the my interpretation, at least, I'm certainly not an expert on 18th century American uh, history, is that the founders saw that as a problem, and that their solution was a small professional army and a very large amateur army. And the idea, that was the militia, that was the Second Amendment. And the idea was that the if you were, had to fight an enemy, the size of the militia would make up for the fact that it wasn't very good and you would have some professionals sort of organizing it as well. And if the professional army tried to take over, they'd be outnumbered 100 to 1. And that was, I think, a fairly clever solution to that problem in the late 18th century. Uh, and as you know, since you've now read my chapters on national defense and machinery, uh, I suggest that one possible model for defending a stateless society would be something similar, where you have a professional elite who are paid at least partly by charity, and then a much larger amateur uh, body who are doing it for some mixture of patriotism, fun, feeling of isn't it great to be a soldier as long as you're not likely to get killed uh, and so forth and i think that would be a possible model and i point out that we have quite a lot of people who do play at warfare as it were at their own cost in our society and there might be ways of working and there might not be i mean it depends a whole lot on what the society is like oh yeah the, the one thing that i would say about that that i would uh, have a little bit of pause is the kind of so basically if i understand from what you wrote in the the revised chapter Mm -hmm. So this is sort of like the national sport would be wargaming or, or, or LARPing, to use the modern uh, vernacular. Yeah. Um, A national sport. Something like that really, I think, now again, also the key for this society is it's a voluntary society, so there's no external, no internal compulsory government extracting right. taxes and such. Um, the only time I can think of any historical example of something like that would have been in medieval England with the assizes of arms, where... Uh, it, archery was the only legal sport on Sundays, and you were mandated you had to play, you had to perform archery, which is how they could recruit so many large bodies of archers during the Hundred Years' War. But to produce that kind of a situation, there was this government that out prohibited what you could and could not do. So I think it would be, it's, it's certainly possible, it's conceivable, and it was actually implemented in a kind. I think the question is, how could you implement that a sizes of arms kind of scenario Without we, the English king, we, we, we don't, don't at the present have any legal, legal rules that can compel people to engage in either paintball or uh, SCA medieval combat, Society of Creative Anachronism. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Nonetheless, I've seen armies of more than a thousand people with swords and shields out there on the field in Pensick, and I gather from a little web research that the number of people who are involved in paintball is up in at least the hundreds of thousands, maybe by now in the, in the millions. So it, it seems to me. We're talking about a much richer society than Anglo-Saxon England. Uh, you don't need the whole population to be doing it. If you think about in modern societies, what fraction of the population are in the military, you're probably talking typically less than 1%. Maybe for the U.S. it might be as high as 1% if you add up everybody. Uh, so it seems to me that you can, can plausibly uh, expect not that I'm confident you'll be able to do it, but you yeah, might be able to do it. No, the, the example I gave in the chapter, which I sort of liked, was the Kipling story, which is in which he's imagining. Now, the system he's imagining is one which has some government involvement, but a lot of it, it's clear, is social pressure. Uh, that, you know, it's sort of, if, if you're a good person, of course you'll be doing these things, and we won't respect you very much, and the girls won't go out with you, and so forth, yeah. if you don't. So you can think of all sorts of mechanisms of that sort. But let me go back for a minute to something else you said, which is, which was, I think, in a sense, a mistake more generally, when you talk about doing things perfectly or not perfectly. Because I'm an economist. Yeah. And from the standpoint of an economist, there is a criterion of what of what means to do things perfectly. So that uh -huh. it's not 
just uh, do we have better or, or worse national defense. It's also do we have optimal national defense. You can say in principle, if you knew enough, what's the point at which another dollar spent on national defense is by stopped by more than a dollar worth of security. So my point initially was that in the case of uh, national defense produced as a public good on a private system, uh, you could expect that you would not get that far, that you would have a suboptimal level of expenditure. In the case of the government production, you might have a suboptimal or a superoptimal, because the government doesn't have a good magnitude for optimizing. That for producing most other things, uh, for food and schooling and so forth, the market gives you at least a first approximation of the optimum. So it's not, the question is not as simple as can the government produce the same services at the same cost. It's more nearly does the government come closer to producing that level of services which give the optimal trade-off, as it were, between yeah. cost, and cost and benefit. And the answer for most things is yes, and for national defense it's only maybe. Yeah, no, I would agree um, about, about the abstract ideal and then optimizing within the parameters. But I, but I was more getting at the kind of utopianism you see in some libertarians. Uh, that it's all going to get solved somehow. Um, but you mentioned uh, the, opt the, the, uh, the, the, the optimizing the services. Now, when I read the accounts of, of, of these sort of federative institutions that libertarians uh, postulate might arise to organize the militias or, or the national defense, mm -hmm. I, I get the impression there's going to be a lot more institutions doing the same kind of work that's already being done in the U.S. government. So that, that seems to indicate, so for the, for the same level of security, I, let's say let's say hypothetically it is cheaper monetarily, but it, but I would it, look, it sounds like there's going to be more working parts, more organizations, more uh, uh, working parts in there that are more autonomous. One of the things that I see is if you have uh, the, the Navy principle of KISS, keep it simple, stupid, a system with fewer working parts in an engineering context is Cerebus Paradis, less likely to break down. Uh, and more likely to be robust and deal with uh, the sort of uh, whatever hiccups might happen to the system. So I think on, on, on that level, one of the things that I haven't seen explored is it, it looks like that the libertarian solution, let's say it, it is achieved, would have more working parts involved uh, and then more, more autonomous parts as well, which would then I think might lead to uh, th this principle of having more working parts and therefore there's more parts to break down. Therefore, if you want to provide the service, it's better to have by, by your standards, uh, the Afghans in the 19th century had more working parts than the British Empire. Nonetheless, it was the British Empire that ends up being effectively defeated in those wars. It, it, mm -hmm. it does not end up in control of Afghanistan and it loses quite a lot of people, at least the, uh, at least in one of the rounds. Uh, so I think your part, part of the problem is that your analogy, is thinking of a machine where each part is dependent on all the others. But if you think about the way markets usually work, that's not the case. So that our system of producing food, in, a, in your language, our system has a lot more, more parts than the Stalin system did. Yes. Nonetheless, our system works a whole lot better. This so. Because the fact that one farmer makes a mistake doesn't mean that everything else goes wrong. It just means that farmer goes out of business. Uh, and I don't know. I mean, I haven't, I haven't run any wars, uh, except yeah. on computers. So, so I'm not sure to what extent you can have a system which is many independent actors, but sufficiently good coordination, uh, so that, you know, I'm, I'm in a way reminded about somebody's line about the internet, that the internet interprets censorship as, as failure and roots around it. That you can have systems that are very complicated in one sense and yet relatively stable in another. Uh, yeah, one thing is, okay, so this, this is an interesting uh, thing that I'd like to get clear on, is so for successfully repelling an invader, yes, Afghanistan was a successful example uh, of repelling at least two invaders so far, the British and the Soviets. Um, now, but at an extreme cost, uh, especially uh, with the Soviets bombing them and destroying their countryside, uh, Vietnam as well in the U.S. context. Now, but notice those were both cases where it was being attacked by a much more powerful enemy. 
yep. the actual resources. Now it's a little complicated because in the Afghan case, the Afghans had the advantage that they were there already, and the British had to. But the British had had Indian troops as well as Afghan troops, as well as Indian and English troops. So they had yeah. relatively local forces as well. Uh, so no, I, I I don't think I'm arguing that a U.S. A country with 20 million people could successfully defend itself against a, you know, a Nazi Germany, whatever, oh, yeah. with a Nazi empire with 200 million. Uh, but then I'm not sure the U.S. could under under other yeah, circumstances you know, either. Well, I guess the question I was getting at though is, when when the when the libertarian debate that I had, the idea of defense, a successful provision of defense, was not getting occupied. Now, if, if we add, because at least in that context, that was one of the criteria. The real success actually is not getting attacked. Yes. The real success is having a situation where attacking looks like a net loss to any likely attacker, and therefore they don't. Yeah, well, the, 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 if, we, if you have like an ordered hierarchy, not getting attacked would be the ideal. Uh, but if you are attacked to repel the enemies at the border, and if that fails, at the very least, if they occupy you, to at some point kick them out. Yes. Now, uh, all, all of those would count as success, but I think that uh, the first one not getting attacked at all, Afghanistan has not been able to match that order. And, and also, it hasn't... Uh, well, that isn't quite right, because most of, for most of the last 150 years, nobody was attacking Afghanistan. And one of the reason was the lessons learned when the when the when the British did. There's there's two other, there's another factor too. You mentioned El Salvador and Afghanistan. These smaller nations are also on spheres of influence of larger powers, and yep. so uh, they don't get attacked because uh, either the smaller nations in that sphere of influence would would incur immediate retaliation from the great power, and or or another great power won't wouldn't invade for the same reason. So for example. Or in the yeah, Afghan case, the great power will feed weapons to the defenders yes. in order to make things expensive for another great power. Well, like, all of those things could happen. Out. Again, you, you have to consider your hypothetical stateless society in lots of different environments. Exactly. If it's a stateless United States, it is a great power in an economic sense. Uh, I did some calculations at the time of the Iraq War, and I added the first Iraq War, and I added up the GNP on the two sides. And the odds in that war measured by GNP were roughly 100 to 1. Mm -hmm. All right, that's not a war. Uh, no, that's a turkey shoot. Yeah, and, but, but in the same sense, it seems to me that if you end up imagining a not very powerful state attacking, attacking a stateless version of what's now the United States, we're going to have the advantage of being a great deal richer, of having better resources, and therefore, even though we are going to be spending a suboptimal sum, we may very well make it un unprofitable. If you reverse the terms, it gets much harder. But you can also imagine, if you reverse the terms, if you imagine a small stateless society, one of the possibilities is that it survives because none of the great powers want any of the other great powers to grab it. Like Switzerland. That's one. Switzerland. Yeah, well, Switzerland. The, you know, Germany, Italy, France, they all protect Switzerland, so they don't tend to invade each other. But I have a question of clarification here. Now, a lot of times uh, libertarians will point to the market displacing what we had previously thought were government services. So like the end of the Cold War, it all, there's a, all this privatization in Eastern Europe. And even in Western Europe with the collapse of the social uh, welfare states, like in the, the, the winter of discontent when Thatcher was elected. So would it be, and I know some libertarians think this way, I don't know if you do, but would, would it be fair to argue that you're arguing that um, if and when this, this, this private uh, solution is, is discovered, that it will, ha it will we'll see in the realms of defense and security the same kind of privatization that we saw at the end of the Cold War when the socialist states privatized most of their services? I don't, I don't think, think I'm, I'm making, making any predictions at all. All, all I'm, I'm saying is that I can plausibly imagine a stable set of internal institutions for a stateless society, and I basically spent part three of Machinery of Freedom when I first wrote it, sketching out what those institutions might look like. If you had a society of that sort, it might be able to defend itself against other aggressive nations, depending on how big the threat was, to what extent the institutions and uh, the 
characteristics of the population uh, were, were enough to, to do it. It might not be. And so I've tried to sketch ways in which you might be able to organize such a defense. And there are a bunch of, of potential ones, ways of doing it. And, you know, the very simplest is charity that we currently uh, spend quite a lot of money on various things which are more or less pure public goods. Uh, my favorite example, because it's not obvious, is tipping. That if you're tipping at a restaurant, you're not going to come back to. Or if you're tipping a taxi cab driver, you'll never see again. You are really contributing to a pure public good, giving and creating an incentive for better service by the waiters and by the, by the cab drivers, even though you're not getting that benefit. And that's a case of some set of internalized norms of sort of the idea, I don't want to be a skin flint. Uh, I want to feel like a responsible person. And if you're in a meal with somebody else, you don't want them to think of you as skin flint and so forth. And yet, that, that produces quite a lot of money. Uh, so you can equally imagine, I think, a society where sort of one of the norms is that everybody ties themselves, everybody ships in 1% of his income to donate to some sort of a uh, equivalent of an army. That's one way of doing it. I've sketched other ways you could do it. One thing that's interesting is what you just said there about uh, giving giving money, sort of having as a cultural norm that you give a percent of your income. That, that I don't know if you've read uh, the Pentateuch lately, but that's how Moses organizes the funding of the Israelite forces. They have to pay. The tithe does, doesn't only go to the priesthood. It also goes to maintaining the Israelite army. Um, so, so there is there is that. Was, that was, was this voluntary or involuntary? I don't know enough about the. I don't. Religion. I don't think it was voluntary. I, the, from what I remember, the Old Testament was fairly. Because, as you may know, there's something very similar in Islamic law that the tax that all Muslim, the, the Quranic tax, the tax all Muslims are supposed to pay, quite interesting from a libertarian standpoint, because it doesn't have to be paid to the government. That there's basically a mechanism for calculating how much you owe each year. And you can either give it to the ruler to spend, there's a list of about eight things that's supposed to be spent on, one of which is uh, supporting warriors who will fight for the faith, mm -hmm. one of which is supporting students, supporting the poor, I don't remember the list of things. And you can either give it to the ruler who will then spend it on those things, or you can spend it on those things yourself, or you can give it to a private middleman who is allowed to collect, I think, I think it's one-ninth of the amount you give him for himself for his payment, and then distributes the rest of it to the appropriate categories of recipients. So that's a case where my, I don't know, that modern Muslim societies aren't really very Muslim from a, from a legal standpoint. Yeah, they're not. The, the, the Saudis come a little closer than the, than, than the others. But in terms of the traditional system, at least, I'm not sure to what extent there was actually legal compulsion to pay the Quranic tax, and to what extent it was just that the people believed in the religion, and therefore they, many of them, maybe most of them, uh, in fact, did it. But I think that one one objection that can be raised to the private uh, system of defense <coughs> is that uh, in in when we see private product production of a service versus a public production of a service, specifically at the end of the Cold War, we've seen a consistent replacement of the public provision of a service with the private provision of the service. But you're and talking now about services where the market is unambiguously superior. Yeah. At least a libertarian yeah. believe it is. Yeah, but but, so, but, but, but what I'm point is, if it is still superior, one would expect to... Uh, but I'm not arguing that the market is superior for defense. Oh, okay. Arguing that not having a government is superior mm -hmm. and that the problems of defense with the market may not be enough to change that. Okay, yeah. Because uh, the debate that I had, the one that you listened to, there was there was a whole set of different terms, so we're trying to sort of feel this out, okay. to feel what the terms are for this one, this discussion. But I think the point, one of the points in favor of, again, not, not a blank check on all public armies, but the idea that when you have a sort of rootless uh, private army, they tend to be more predatory towards the people they rule over. It's easier to get them to uh, attack the people they rule over rather than uh, protect them. Which would, how would you describe the new model army? Cromwell's army. Yeah, the new model army. I, I think Cromwell's army in many ways reminds me of what we saw in the late Roman Republic. Uh, 
where you had uh, essentially a, a private army in the sense that it was uh, loyal to the individual, the pri uh, a private person, and there was the primary loyalty was to the private person. In this this case, the the person of Oliver Cromwell. But but nonetheless, it was an army that had not that had been been raised as a national army. It had been supported by taxes. Uh, it was not a private army in 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 your sense in your sense at all. No, the the question of why things break up uh, in the late Roman Republic period is an interesting question. But I'm not sure that. Mm -hmm. Putting it in terms of private armies tells you tells you very much because those armies were no no more private than the U.S. Army is at present. Well, what I mean by private is in the sense that so when libertarians look at speculative futures for society, right. they'll look at historical examples that that where this or that example comes close to approximating the 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 relevant facts that they're trying to prove. Yes. Now they're going to say, yeah, we know that it doesn't. Like, for instance, Iceland wasn't an actual anarcho-capitalist society, but it's popular. I think you've written about Iceland um, before. Because it's, as far as I know, I introduced Iceland into the libertarian uh, mind. As it were. Yeah, no, but Iceland it, but it, but it closely approximates, to as, right? It closely approximates uh, certain aspects. I it's what before. I refer to as a semi-stateless society in the sense that there was no executive arm of government. There was a legislature and a court system. On the other hand, it looks as though about 90% of disputes resolved outside of the court system by private negotiation or arbitration. And once the court gave a verdict, there was no government mechanism to enforce the verdict, that all verdicts were privately enforced. So in that sense, it's, I guess, whether you consider it anarchist or not depends on what you consider the essential features of, of a government. But it was, it was more... It was more like a government than the system I sketched in machinery because there was a single law code. On the other hand, it's not entirely clear. I've actually discussed this with Jesse Bayak, who's one of the actual professional experts in this subject. And his view is that the law code was less important than it claimed to be. And that it was really much more a matter of what the Icelandic farmers were willing to put up with rather than what the legislature, which was made up of the sort of leadership, had or hadn't agreed to put into law. Uh, it's, it's actually, if you're sufficiently curious, I've got a, my current book project is a book on legal systems very different from ours. Mm -hmm. The draft is webbed, and I have a chapter on Iceland in which I expand and in some ways correct my old article on Iceland. Uh, and one of the really interesting puzzles that I start with is that we have two different accounts of the legal system. We have some written accounts of what the rules were from the very end of the period not official statute books. Those don't exist as far as I know. So these were presumably private documents saying what they believed the law was. And then we have detailed descriptions of what actually happened in the sagas, including not only the sagas that were written several hundred years after the events, but also the sagas describing the end of the period, which were written by people who participated in the events they're describing. The legal rules described in the the list of legal rules are not consistent with what actually is we see happening in the sockets. And so that's a puzzle which I discuss in some detail trying to figure out what's what's going on. But to, to, to just to, to finally clarify the point yep. is the reason why I use some of those examples, oh, another one was Meiji Japan, was not so much because they were privately funded in the sense that a libertarian would desire, but we see, in, especially in uh, Tokugawa, not sorry, the civil war in Japan, competing military forces. Ever, which, which civil war? The one, well, the one... From you mean the post-Meiji civil war? No, before. For, 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 the, the warring states, Sengoku, uh, from 1467 to 1615. That's post-Meiji. No, I'm sorry. I'm yeah, sorry. I was Meiji. using Meiji and Hei on my mistake. Yeah. So, but the example, so Japan, right, we have we have this before the collapse of the uh, shogunate, and then, yeah. then, the, then or sorry, the emperor before the collapse of the emperor, then the shogunate, then the new emperor. But there's this yeah. period of civil war. So we have in Japan a competing security forces, and it's a, it's a civil war that lasts 150 years. You get the uh, Tokugawa Isa and the Tokugawa dynasty. Now, there's lots of problems with the Tokugawas, but they, they restore the equilibrium of peace and security that Japan had lacked. And yeah. what, that's, that's why I was pointing to them as... We see what happens when we have competing security forces over a given geographic region. 
And I think Would that you I also describe World War Two and World War One as competing security forces over a geographical region? You you could at some point, yes. So therefore, you're arguing for world government, right? Well, you see, uh, see, here's how it goes, right? There's, I'll say, uh, here's my proviso: it's optimized provision, right? So if you get too big, it's not optimized. So it's, I think it's more of an optimizing question. So I'd say, like, the label of Japan and a nation state, that would be more optimized. Whereas something like as large as Genghis Khan's empire, but, that may not be optimized. Well, that worked pretty well. But but for a moment, you're really talking about people where what they're competing over is the ability to collect taxes. Mm -hmm. And it's a little, that's a slight simplification. But you're talking about people who are competing to be territorial sovereigns. Whereas what we're talking about in the uh, anarcho-capitalist context is people, I, I'm not sure competition is even the right term, but private organizations which are trying to get funding and support for providing the service of defending against foreign invaders. And that's not at all the same logic. Similarly, in the anarcho-capitalist system that I sketched back in part three of machinery, uh, what the firms are protecting to do is to provide their customers with the service of rights protection uh, and dispute settlement, not to not competing over who gets to use force against your customers to make them pay you money. And the logic of those competitions is not the same. Well, I, I would argue, though, that, well, certainly tax revenue was one aspect of uh, the motivations for the, the, the feuding shoguns. There were others, the natural sources of Japan, the uh, who would have access to those resources, whether that be human resources or food or uh, raw materials. And, and a lot of those concerns would still be going concerns for corporations. And we also can look at the East India companies, the Dutch, the British, and the French. Now, they were primarily funded through commerce, through their trade of uh, the various spices and stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and they, they would raise armies to protect their interests. But they were also extremely aggressive um, and uh, very predatory. So, again, um, this actually gets to an article that was written by, it's called Defense in a Free Society. It was in the early 90s, mid-90s. It was written by one of the uh, authors that writes for uh, Mises Institute. And he made the example of the Irish and the, uh, the Northmen and how they were very decentralized, conquering peoples. And he made a point that I think I wish more libertarians did, that, that their success fed the, the, fed the predatory nature that they also... The success of which, the Norse or the Irish? Uh, more the Norse. Um, but even the Irish conquerors, because early on... In the but of course, the Norse were, were unsuccessful. They, they lost Clontarf. Uh, that was the mm -hmm. famous big battle uh, around 1000 AD or so, uh, and they did not succeed in conquering Ireland. No, 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 I, I don't, no, 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 no. The example that he was giving was that in their day they had achieved a level of successful military uh, power projection, and yeah. that, 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 actually, that actually becomes a threat to liberty. So he, his, mm -hmm. his question was, you know, these solutions when they work, work really well, and the problem, the question we need to ask then is how do we make sure that they don't turn against us? Uh, yeah, because... That's part, part of the reason why what I'm, what I'm sketching in, in the third edition of Machinery, uh, I wouldn't really say I revised the chapter on national defense. I wrote two different chapters on national mm -hmm. defense. But the second one, uh, I'm trying to sketch a system where there isn't anybody in a position to use their military power to take over the country. Uh, and that's why I'm really sort of uh, taking off on what I saw as a Second Amendment solution. Mm -hmm. That you have a system where there is a relatively small, organized, professional military funded largely by charity, although I could also imagine they're selling services to the amateurs uh, of various sorts. Uh, and then a very large amateur military, uh, and that means that, that you're back in the situation where, where, where you don't have a group in a good position to seize things and, and take stuff. Have you considered the example of the military holy orders in the Middle Ages of a sort of non-state uh, security force to edit No. I, I do have, actually, my first novel has something a little bit like that uh, in it. Uh, and actually part of, part of what I was doing in that novel, which in this odd sense is related to this, is looking at the advantages and disadvantages of different forms of uh, sort of political organization. So that I have a world where my protagonist society is very loosely modeled on Saga Period Iceland. 
and his allies are loosely modeled on early Norman England, and the aggressors are very loosely modeled on some kind of a mix of Roman, Byzantine, and Abbasid models, and the other allies are a, mil a female military order. And it's not religious, but it's again. I was so, thinking of so Amazons, like, basically, right? What? So Amazons, female. Well, I wouldn't call them Amazons. It, it, it doesn't have that feel. But oh, but okay. but but my point is only that all of these have advantages and disadvantages. So that my protagonist, who is a leader of his society, and since I get to write the book, a brilliant general, uh, has the problem that he has no tax revenues to hire soldiers and no feudal levies to provide soldiers. And therefore, his military behavior has to be has to be a large logistic warfare in which you don't get your people killed, because if you get many of them killed, nobody will come next time. Mm -hmm. And in which when you win, you ransom the captives back to the other side in order to get the money with which to reward your troops. And I'm oversimplifying a little bit. Mm -hmm. The other systems all have their disadvantages. So that on the one hand, I've got on the enemy side, there is a general who technically is as good as my as my protagonist, mm -hmm. but he's much less innovative, he's much less likely to do odd and original things because people who do odd and original things in the in the imperial army are likely to get hanged uh, at some point in their career. So that there's a sort of trade-off between the advantages of the different systems. And that was sort of one of the points. I did never made it explicitly, but one of the things, because I'm not interested in using fiction to sort of prove my ideas are right, but it's interesting to explore what are the weaknesses and strengths of the alternative systems. Did you did you publish this? This sounds yes, really this was published by This was actually published by Bain quite a while back. And it's, yeah, the title is Harold. It was not very successful. It was the first novel. I've actually published two novels, that one by Bain and a second one I self-published, which was not related, which was another set of ideas. Mm. And at this point, I'm fairly close to having a sequel of the second one done. Yeah, I just I was thinking of something that referred back to Afghanistan and Vietnam and being able to be drive out the invaders. One of the things that I think needs to be considered, and I don't know if it's been considered before, is that those countries in the 20th century were what we would call LDCs. Uh, and the, the, whether you're a state or not a state, the more uh, developed you are economically, industrially, technically, the more brittle you become because you're dependent on these very uh, narrow sources of energy and power. And I think it's a bit disanalogous because, yes, Afghanistan was essentially an LDC when it was invaded, as was Vietnam, and they had the benefits of being supplied by outside sources. But in, a, in an eco-capitalist or libertarian society, would be an extremely technologically advanced one, and I, I don't I think it's a bit disanalogous because the kind of robustness and the ability to get by on you know eating rice cakes would not really be viable. Have, with, have, with, have, have you read either Seeing Like a State or The Art of Not Being Governed? No, no. I'm trying. I'm blocking on the name of the author. He's an interesting guy who mm -hmm. really thinks of himself as a left winger, but has ideas that libertarians like, and is a little bothered by that fact. But it, what he's writing about is mostly history in Asia, where he's arguing that the pattern for a very long time was uh, states typically in the rice growing areas, uh, surrounded by stateless areas in the hills, in the swamps, in various other places. And when the states were doing well, they tended to expand and to pull in people either by immigration or by slave raids. When they were doing badly, it went the other direction. That the view of the states was that the stateless people were just primitive, that they hadn't yet learned the arts and so forth. But it wasn't really true because the stateless people might well be the grandchildren of people who had been under a state, you know, a century before under the same round. And he discusses a good deal of interesting stuff about what circumstances make it easier or harder to rule things. Uh, now this is all in from our standpoint. All of these societies are pretty primitive by our standpoint. Yeah, yeah. But 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 for example, one point which would never occur to 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 me is that if you're going to be stateless with a state adjacent to you, it is better to have root crops than to have rice or grain, because rice or grain you harvest it all at once. It's there sitting stored up, and an, an army can come and grab it. Yeah. Root crops are in the ground until you eat them. 
and it is therefore a good deal harder for the aggressor to seize your food supply. And he talks about other things, mm -hmm. but it just struck me that <clears throat> as Scott, I think his last name is Scott, the, the author, mm -hmm. uh, the, it, it struck me as interesting in terms of thinking about what details of the society made it more or less expensive to conquer a sport. Mm. Uh, and he doesn't go into what would interest me, namely how the stateless societies are actually organized. That's not really his subject. Uh, but, and then from the other side, seeing lack of state is really about the ways in which states reorganize the societies they rule in order to make them easier to rule. So that, for example, France in, say, the 16th or 17th century, there was not a national language, all right? That uh, one of the things you want to do in order to establish a successful state is everybody speaking the same language. So the administrators you send out, send out from, from Paris when they get to Provence are not dependent on local translators. Uh, you want to have consistent units of measurement so that when you're taxing people, Everybody defines property rights the same way, uses the same units of measure, so that it's reasonably easy. You want to have a uniform system of naming, so you keep track of people's in order to know who you've drafted and who you haven't, who pay taxes. In. Very interesting stuff. Uh, and as I say, it's, it's stuff that libertarians like, even though I think James Scott, I think, is the author's name, but I don't know. I have to check that. I've met him and debated him. He's an interesting I'll guy. I'll check those um, out. Those seem like very interesting uh, topics. But, but so would you would you agree or or disagree that being an LDC country makes it easier to wage that kind of Afghan or Vietnamese war, where say Liechtenstein and a lot of libertarians like that is quasi in uh, or quasi libertarian. Um, it's it's small, and if you compare it to a similarly small LDC country, I think the LDC country would have a better opportunity to. I'm not sure if you're right or I'm not sure if you're right or not. To begin with, the LDC country is much closer to starvation, and therefore it would be a good deal easier to defeat it by just making it a bit harder to produce food. Whereas a society like ours, uh, we've got. Roughly speaking, developed countries at the moment have a per capita real income 20 to 30 times what the average for the world was through most of history. So we've got a whole lot of fat, in a sense, short of the point where we're actually dying. Uh, there's actually was a news story not long ago about one of the one of the Baltic countries where they're worried about Russia, and they've actually had a fairly large scale uh, private people training for guerrilla warfare uh, on the assumption they might have to do it. Uh, and so I'm not sure if you're right or not. I mean, it's an interesting question. I think a lot, there are going to be a lot of variables. I think that a, a case where you have strong feelings of sort of patriotism and nationalism and such is going to help because everybody's going to hate the invaders. And that's one of the things that would happen, I think, in the Baltic <coughs> countries. Yeah. Uh, and it also depends on, on how on the invaders are. The invaders, the sort of high morale troops who always do what the commanders say, or can they easily be bribed, seduced, and so forth, and to, you know, selling their guns to the enemy side for some money or, or sex or something. Yeah. Uh, so so I, I don't think, I, my guess is that there aren't going to be simple answers, but I really don't know enough to, okay. to say with great confidence. One question of, of service uh, being, uh, military service being provided privately that has very seldom been discussed is the Navy. Um, because one of the things that I, I get the impression of from libertarians uh, is that, you know, they, 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 of course, they are capitalists, so they advocate free trade, the free flow of goods, and all this. Now, when we look at the historical record, whether it's the Silk Road in Eurasia or international trade beginning with the Dutch, there's the, the trade route itself is typically secured by either a single power or a concert of power. So in the Silk Road, it was the Romans, the Persians, the Chinese, and the Indians. You know, uh, in the 19th and 20th century, it was the British and Americans. Now, but of course, the Silk Road it wasn't the concert. It, it wasn't was like, like the uh, Tang Chinese were actually, or the Han Chinese, better were talking to the Romans. Oh no, no, not in that sense. But uh, uh, they were. They all. But each of it was in the interest of each of yeah. those states to permit commerce. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's true that if the whole trade, if the whole line by land is held by a single country, you will get a more nearly optimal level of taxation. Mm 
because from the taxer standpoint, uh, and you also get a lower level of taxation because if you think through, this is actually what my first published part of my first published journal article was about my theory of the size and shape of nations, which you might find interesting. It's yeah. on my web page. But if you have a single trade route and 10 countries along it, it's in the interest of each of those countries to have a greater than optimal tax level. Because when you raise the taxes, you increase the revenue you get per unit coming across, you decrease the amount of trade, but most of the cost of the decreased trade has gone to the other nine countries that are all taxing the same trade. So that's an incentive to unify along a single route. But that's much less true by sea, because uh, by sea there isn't a single blocking position, uh, and there can be quite a lot of countries which have an incentive to suppress piracy because they want to trade with you. Well, but let, let me give you an example of uh, the Mediterranean. So uh, sure. the, Ro the Roman Navy, you know, Mara Nostrum, uh, in the late Republic, uh, you know, Caesar was famously captured by pirates, and they were destroyed by uh, Pompey. Pompey, the Pompey made that right. He made his reputation destroying pirates. Yes. And so more or less from Pompey the Great until the Vandals, piracy was more or less suppressed throughout the Mediterranean. Now, when the Roman Navy uh, disappeared, at least in the West, of course, in the East, it continued with Greek fire. Uh, piracy exploded. The, the Vandals and then later the Arabs. And, and, and trade throughout the Mediterranean uh, was heavily reduced until the Italian city-states in the uh, 11th and 12th centuries began to police the sea lanes again. So it's not just saying the state needs to provide it, but what we haven't seen is any sort of, at least I haven't seen it, I've been reading about this question for as long as I can remember, um, you're familiar with the Perrin thesis? Yes. Because that's what you're, you're playing off of, yeah, really. Yeah, I like Perrin. He's cool. Except, um, except that Perrin thought it was the Muslims uh, blocking trade. It's not clear that that really happened. But. Well, it's just that the point was just the piracy developed uh, in the absence of a strong naval presence. So eh, we're talking about is it is it possible that you could privatize a fleet to the extent that you could provide the same level of deterrence to pirates uh, to protect your own trade. We're not even talking about invading other countries. If you want to trade with China and there's pirates you know, operating out of Shanghai. But if China is an, if China is a nation, as long as you're only talking about a world where some places are nations and some aren't, the Chinese Navy will take care of this problem, right? In your hypothetical, well, the you, well, Chinese want to trade with us. I would look at say that if we look at the past 300 years of global trade, uh, global trade it, globalism really only occurs under the ages of a naval hegemon, whether it's the Dutch, the British, or the Americans. You think the U.S. at pre you think the U.S. at present is suppressing piracy? I think let me put it this way: yes and no, and let me explain that. Uh, in the sense that yes, piracy is becoming a problem in the Straits of Malacca and in Somalia, um, but on the on the flip side, if the U.S. Uh, Navy was now a global presence. I'd not, I think we would not only see higher rates of piracy, we would see even nations like rogue states, uh, like we would see when the Roman Empire fell. The, the Vandals became a rogue state of pirates. So they didn't just have their own little petty pirate fleets, they had a whole apparatus behind it. And so I think it's both yes and no. There's a level I think of better, 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 a more recent example and a better known example for that would be on the one hand the Barbary pirates yes. and on the other hand the Knights of St. John who were, were running the, the same business with a very interesting case of market division that basically the Barbary pirates in theory were raiding the Christian ships and the Knights of St. John in theory were raiding the Muslim ships. Uh, and in both cases you have deals between the governments whose ships were being raided where they pay off one or the other of the pirate groups to get immunity for their ships but anyway yeah, yeah ultimately the pirates were defeated by the french when the french invaded uh, algeria and tunisia in the uh, well, but the u.s the u.s also defeated them a little earlier uh, well, in we the paid them off twice uh, yeah. 1815 was the last time but a lot of the question really becomes mm -hmm. is it suppose there are no national governments at all for a moment which is the more yeah. interesting case yeah then it becomes the question of whether the individual trading firms can can make piracy expensive enough yes. so it doesn't profit. There is actually a Poole Anderson short story which is about this subject and the title of the story is Margin of Profit and this is a science fictional version with interstellar trade but the basic solution in that case to piracy 
is to arm a minority of the merchant ships without making it obvious they're armed, mm -hmm. such that the pirates are losing often enough so that piracy is, this is state piracy, I should say, in that case, is on net a losing game, hence the title margin of profit. So that sounds like the Q ships from World War One, the British ships that... Well, here's the thing, right, with... with um... Now, there's a the trouble with the Q ships, as I'm sure you know, is yeah. that it then results in torpedoing yeah. merchant ships instead of just uh, surfacing, letting them put the people on the lifeboats and then sinking them with cannon fire. Yeah, exactly. But the point that I was getting at with, with the Navy, and now I'm not I'm not saying also, I'm not saying that a group of powers couldn't police the uh, uh, corporations or whatever, could police yeah. the global Navy. But what, what I am saying is that we have yet to see in principle or in theory how a private hegemon or a private group of powers could, could, as you rightly said, raise the cost of piracy because arming merchant ships is all well and good if these are just like part-time fishermen that become pirates. But if it's a pirate nation, like say the Vandals or the Barbary yeah. Pirates, where they can build but their the, own men of war. But, but, but part of the solution, this goes to the issue which I've discussed in a very different context, which is deterrence as a private good. Mm -hmm. So that if you say uh, my group of, of trading corporations have their own navy and their own navy is not in the business of preventing piracy it's the business of preventing piracy against them yes so if the you tell the pirate nation look our ships fly our flag if you attack one of those ships we'll go attack you and make it as expensive for you as we can attack somebody else's ship we don't mind that's just cutting our our competition and then each of the clusters of, of trading corporations have an incentive to do the same thing. So it's it's a moderately complicated game, as it were. Well, it's not only that. Another another corollary of that as well is that if this company is sufficiently good at deterring piracy against its own ships, it also could have the, the, the result of deterring piracy in toto because... Um, especially if it's difficult for the pirates to always be sure yeah. which ship they're yeah. attacking. This is the standard question of whether my burglar alarm, whether the lock and burglar alarm in my house helps or hurts my neighbors. And if you, it's the same argument. If you assume that there is a very inelastic supply of robbers, then making my house harder to rob deters them into robbing your house instead. If you assume that there are large, that there's an elastic supply of robbers, so when it's harder to do it, there are fewer robbers. And if you assume that it is costly for the robbers to search to figure out who is or isn't defending himself, then you have the opposite effect. Then I'm making being a robber less profitable and defending my neighbors. So you're going to have either positive or negative externalities. And in the same sense, have you read Peter Leeson's book on pirates? pirates? No. no. Uh, it, it, it's called... Uh, Man, I, I need a reading it, list. You give me so many good books. I need to write them all down. Yes. It, it's called The Invisible Hook. And I, I don't, I don't like the uh, the title because it's not really analogous to Smith's Invisible Hand. But it's a very interesting book analyzing the 18th century pirate industry from the standpoint of a modern economist. And part of what's going on there is he explains why you had the Jolly Roger equivalent, why pirate flag pirate ships identified themselves, and the reason is that they've that their competitors are the coast guards that the Coast Guards are seizing trader ships in territorial waters that don't have permission to be there. That the pirates want the reputation that if you surrender to us, we'll treat you nicely. And if you fight us, we'll treat you terribly. Mm. The Coast Guard would also like that reputation, but they can't afford to do it because slaughtering the crew of the, uh, when you're a, a official government legal agency, you're not supposed to murder all the people who on, on the ship that ran away from you. Yeah, it's hard. Uh, the Coast Guard would like to free ride on the pirates' reputation. Mm -hmm. So the pirates have a symbol, namely the pirate flag, which announces I'm a pirate. Coast Guards who fly that symbol are going to get into trouble because they're announcing they're pirates. And therefore, the pirates can get the benefit. It's, all, it's like private deterrence, only in re reverse. Mm -hmm. They're trying to deter merchant ships from fighting them, uh, making them surrender instead. So... So I think you'd have lots of interesting possible logic to that situation, mm -hmm. um, and it would, be, it would be fun. Somebody ought to do it as a computer game, <laughs> to, sort of pirates versus traders uh, in mm. some hypothetical, mm -hmm. modern or historical, it doesn't really matter, world. Well, one interesting uh, 
thing about piracy and deterrence, this would be one of the advantages of the libertarian model of free trade, is if you look at the history of uh, Stephen Turnbull, who studies Japanese uh, samurai warfare during that, civil, that mm -hmm. long century-long civil war period, he writes that the pirate kings that would, would be like part-time, most of the pirates were sailors who couldn't sell goods in China because of tariff barriers. And when, uh -huh. the, when China had low tariff barriers, there was low piracy because they could trade and, 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 and they could make you know, a living. But when yep. the tariff barriers went up, well, they were out of a job. They couldn't yep. trade with anybody, so they resorted to piracy. So in one sense, that would, be, that, would, that would be a way the libertarians would deter piracy by deterring the root cause of it because mm -hmm. you're allowing for free trade of goods that 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 tariff barrier would not necessarily uh, be but, creating but, but, rob, but robbery may still be profitable. Sure, it still may be profitable. Now the other question is the kind of world where this kind of security of the sea lanes would be maintained. There's really there's really two questions I have here. One, do you envision it as being the kind of the world where you wouldn't need to have carrier task force fleets, and so you get by with smaller amounts of spending? Because if it is a world where you would still need carrier task force fleets, that then raises a very serious question of how would they be built, funded, and maintained? Yeah, but first we've got a whole bunch of variables here. One of them is, is this a world with one stateless society where everybody is stateless? Yes. Or somewhere between those. And if it's one stateless society, then I am assuming that some of the great powers who have governments will be trying to prevent piracy because they want to trade with us. Uh, after all, if they don't want to trade with us, all they have to do is have tariffs. They don't need to encourage piracy. If it's a world with only stateless societies, but in which some of the stateless societies, or in the stateless societies, want to be pirates, then it really uh, might. My guess is you don't need that. You're that, that that it's going to be very hard to organize piracy on a scale large enough to require a carrier task force to deal with it. Mm. Uh, uh, that the ca ca carrier task forces, after all, are not currently being used to deal with pirates. They're being used to support uh, land wars mostly. Uh, yeah, at uh, this point, yeah. But um, but let's let's go back to the the older ship, the older carrier, the ship of the line. Which yes. was the, the then the British did actively suppress suppress piracy in places like the Caribbean, uh, the Straits of Malacca, and I think along the Zanzibar coast because there's a lot of piracy in that area as well. And one of the things that we see is now with modern technology there is there is a power gap in favor of the state now. But historically, from say the ancient Minoans when they sort of policed the Eastern Mediterranean for trade between Egypt and Greece. There's a rough parity of technology. The ships the pirates yeah. have are more or less the same kinds of ships that the, the, the state would have in the same yeah. situation. Even, even in uh, the 18th and 19th centuries. Now, there is one difference. I don't think you saw too many ships of the line run by pirates. I think they tend to be more like uh, uh, corvettes, frigates, uh, and things of that nature. Yeah. And so... But you see, those heavier ships uh, gave a decisive advantage to the British Navy when they did hunt down the pirates in those regions. And so I think you're right in this sense that the pirates would not likely be able to build their own carriers or, or battleships or whatever you want to call them, yeah. unless it's a pirate state, in which case it's a whole different... A pirate yeah. corporation, maybe. That'd be a different scenario. But we um, do have, after all, pirate states in, in, in the case of, uh, of, of the North African uh, yes. states. Uh, that the, there were three of them basically mm -hmm. uh, on the North African coast, and the Barbary pirates were theoretically Ottoman uh, sort of warships. That is to say, that they, they, they the, the the Barbary states were under theoretical Ottoman suzerainty, and they had troops on them. Uh, it's an interesting contrast, actually, between the Barbary pirates and the Caribbean pirates. The Caribbean pirates were basically not had no state sponsor. Uh, the Barbary pirates had local state sponsors uh, and ran worked rather differently in, in a bunch of interesting ways. Because as you may know, the Caribbean pirates were basically highly democratic. That the ships were under a one-man, one-one-vote system. 
they had a division of loop, which was almost perfectly egalitarian. They, there were two officers, the captain and the quartermaster. Uh, the captain commanded in combat and the quartermaster more or less the rest of the time. Both of them were elected, could be deposed at any time. The captain and the quartermaster got two or three shares of loot. Everybody else got one share and maybe the cabin boy got a half share. Uh, but it was, lease and stuff is really quite interesting in terms of, in terms of the set. And they had constitutions. The individual pirate ships had written ships articles which stated what the rules were. Uh, so those, those were a very different set of institutions than the Barbary pirates. Well, it's interesting. We see a lot of uh, democratic style institutions tend to be very effective conquerors. The, the Germanic uh, federati that the Romans hired were, were very democratic compared to the Romans. And so are the, the Northmen, as you've mentioned before in your literature. And um, that does, there does seem to be a connection, at least in pre-modern societies, uh, where industrial technology was not as important, that there was a sort of market advantage for being more democratic in that regard. But I guess a more interesting question in this, this whole discussion on navies, what would be the hardest problem given these variables? I think the hardest problem would probably be a nascent libertarian society in a world where it's not wholly run by states, but there are some quite powerful states still around. And uh, it's kind of like in the process of changing, not necessarily, not necessarily to a stateless society in toto, mm -hmm. but, it's a, but the, the nation state is, is still viable, but there's mm -hmm. other competing polities. That would probably be the hardest because you'd still have to worry about carrier fleets as well as pirates. How, how, might, how might that problem except, be? Except that I'm not quite sure what the carrier fleets are doing. Are the, is the carrier sheet fleet from Nation A trying to interfere with, with trade between the stateless society and Nation B? Oh, sorry, yeah. It um, doesn't have to interfere with its own trade. You can do that at, at the ports. I'm thinking more along the lines of uh, invasion. So, like, for example, in the War of 1812 and the American Revolution, yes, we had a very effective privateer campaign. But in one of the key areas of naval strategy, it failed. It did not keep our borders free from British Marines. They could just land wherever they wanted to and attack American forces. Now, presumably, uh, having access to the sea would be great for trade, and a libertarian society would seek to have sea access. How would that security uh, function in any society would have to be uh, uh, pr produced? Uh, and oftentimes, that goes back to the sort of stuff that I'm discussing in, in the third edition, where you have various imperfect ways in which you organize the society to fight people off. That is, I'm not sure that that isn't coming, really getting us back to the beginning of the... Okay. I, guess, I guess looking at this particular problem, uh, the level of plausible alternatives, uh, private alternatives to the public provision of, of naval security, I think we have... it. I think we have fewer examples, and it's a harder sell than for land security, for like armies and, and stuff like that. Maybe. I just, I just say it seems to be less of a problem uh, because of the fact that it's in lots of people's interest to have the sea levels, the sea lanes reasonably clear because they want to trade. They want to trade with us as well as with, with each other. So I'm not sure I see that as that as that that larger problem. One suggestion, by the way, which occurred to me, if you want to do another version of this kind of uh, discussion, do you know Jeff Hummel? Yes. Because he's he's, he's bright. He is on the whole more optimistic about uh, stateless societies defending themselves than I am, uh -huh. uh, and therefore you might find that an interesting person to talk with. You're right. You know, I I did hear a lecture of his. It was during the Cold War, and he was talking about. Well, the Soviet threat, just like you were in the machinery of freedom, because that that really is an existential crisis to any society, uh, privatized or not. Yes. And I think I think that would be sort of, uh, that would be like the sort of the hardest problem to solve. Uh, and and uh, you did mention I think in one of your lectures recently, I don't know where it was given because it was you were projected onto a screen from Skype, but um, you mentioned that we live in a less security uh, risky environment because the Soviet Union's collapsed. Well, while yeah. that's true, when we look at history, security threats rise and fall. So the fact that right now it's security minimum threat, uh, any, any free society would have to also have contingencies in place should something like the Soviet Union or Nazi Germany or the mm -hmm. Roman Empire arise again. And I still think that those kinds of questions you were asking in the original version of machinery of freedom are still mm -hmm. important. They might not seem as important now because 
uh, that threat is not present, but a threat like that could become present again. Sure. And frankly, frankly, if it is if it isn't in the United States, the United States would be that threat for the libertarian society, mm -hmm. unless it takes place within inside the United States as a process of collapse. Um, yeah. So that. But no, but as I, as I said at the beginning, I am not claiming that you can always defend a stateless society yeah. against the state. It depends on how how strong and aggressive the state is, and mm -hmm. and on to what degree the internal institutions of the libertarian of the uh, stateless society make it harder or easier to defend itself. I think I think an interesting way to to pursue this further is. What are the kinds of person, like uh, national traits, that the pe that the people would need to cultivate to be yep. good at providing these kinds of uh, solutions yep. you've been talking about? Because the these solutions that you see in in the historical world, or ones mm -hmm. that we are trying to, or you're trying to create a plausible near future attempt at getting, people aren't fungible. You just can't drop in a Somali or a Kenyan. And, ex or, and expect it to, to, to all work the same way it would if you picked a bunch of, you know, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants to, to do that. Right. Um, so what, what an interesting uh, line of discussion might be, what are the kinds of people, the kinds of virtues, the kinds of personal, uh, national identities yeah. that they would have to cultivate to be able to maintain these uh, institutions? There's a sense in which that's really an issue to explore through novels. Probably not right. my novels. But, but it is the question of how do you tell a believable story either way, a story in which they do succeed or a story in which they don't succeed. Oh, that's, a perfect, that's a perfect venue, by the way, novels. Yeah. Uh, I totally agree. Um, I, think, I think one thing, though, as far as the, the kind of people in which this, this, uh, these solutions would be most suited for, I think, I think largely the Anglosphere uh, demographic is generally... Uh, has the the, dis, the mental dispositions, the uh, the sort of personal traits and virtues, to be quite a well fit for these kinds of solutions. I don't know. They didn't do very well against the Afghans in the 19th century. Oh, well, I meant for defense, for for defending yeah. themselves. Well, my point was that the Afghans were quite successful in it, and they were very different from the Anglo. Yeah, that's true too. They were. So, so what would you say would be the key sort of values that those kinds of people have that that make yeah. them. Uh, able to do that, even if they are very different. I mean, I, 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 I could suggest some ideas, but I don't think I could get very far on it with a lot, a lot more thought. I mean, a, a lot of it really has to do, in a way, it goes back, there's an essay of mine you might want to read, actually it's also a chapter in the third edition if you've got it, on what I think of as a positive account of rights, in which I'm thinking of rights as coming out of commitment strategies, where there are certain things such that if you do, if you try to do to me, I'm willing to bear unreasonably large costs to stop you. Not infinite costs, but unreasonably, what seem like unreasonably large costs. And sort of one of my examples at the national level was England sending its only aircraft carrier and a fleet to defend a couple of barren islands up near Antarctica, which seems crazy, and yet it, it makes sense in an odd sense. So if you have commitment strategies of this sort, and part of what a bunch of things maintain them. They're partly hardwired into your brain. They're partly the fact that if you look like a wimp, you're going to lose status and other people will push you around and such. So I would think that a society with more, with stronger feelings of that sort would be one where people would be more inclined to say, even though surrendering to the local invader is easier, what kind of a man would I be if I did that? Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. I ought to fight them. Uh, a kind, a kind of maybe imagine. honor culture maybe is what you're discussing. Maybe. Yeah, although I, that, that's probably too simple, too, but, yeah. but, <clears throat> but one, anyway. One of the things in this vein of, uh, of talking about what, what might work, now Hans Hopp has written about the idea of time preference and people that have higher time preferences, which I think means they, can look, they, they plan further ahead into the future, are those that would be more apt to build and maintain these institutions, I, I, would, I would think. And I think also that one interesting thing is if you look at, I think he, I think even Hoppe might have made this observation, is that religious people tend to have longer time preferences, so that they look ultimately, I guess, because looking towards eternity, right? Um, they're going to have a longer time preference. And in the case of Afghanistan, you know, they, at this time they were they were Muslim, and there was a the sort of diffuse political structure was 
knit together in part by a religious structure because these different tribes which are otherwise might be fighting each other are well we're all Muslim we're all part of the Ummah we're all part of this mm -hmm. faith and so that helps bind them together in a way that's very difficult to break on the other hand you all have an awful lot of historically of Muslim versus Muslim conflict where the same thing seems to be happening yeah, that is where you're, if, if you think about the way in which groups, people like the Almoravids or the Almohads establish themselves, that's starting out with a bunch of people who have a tribal identity. The other people they're fighting are largely fellow Muslims, and nonetheless, they, they, they manage, to, manage to function. So I don't know. I, mean, I think you're raising a bunch of interesting questions, but I'm not sure that many of them have clean answers. Well, in, in money, in, when it comes to history and sociology and economics, there are very seldom one uh, answer to a problem. A problem mm -hmm. is usually solved by a suite of answers that deal with the various factors involved in solving this problem. And some mm -hmm. problems we can only vaguely grasp at because we haven't actually had to deal with them yet. Because um, mm -hmm. in part, one of the big problems I've seen with libertarians uh, in, in many cases, though some of your literature seems to be correcting this, is if you're trying to create a decentralized, more voluntary, more private society, you need to have an idea of what you're looking for so that you can actually aim at the target to get there so you can create a series of steps. They may not get you there. That's a trial and error process. I mean, in mm -hmm. a lot of ways, that's what Lenin did. Uh, I wish he hadn't done it. But he went from a, a sort of completely speculative system to an actual system. Mm -hmm. But the speculative system was well-defined. And I think, I think uh, having part of that problem, part of the problem is solving that is, is getting more clear definitions so that when you create these speculative solutions, you know. I have another book for you to read. Oh, no. Yes, yes. Ronald, Ronald, Ronald Coase's final book, mm -hmm. How China Went Capitalist. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. as yeah, I interpret what he's saying, he thinks that what happened with China worked better than if they had been taking advice from American economists, even if the economists had been from Chicago rather than from Harvard. That is, that what they were doing was trial and error. That what Deng in particular, but to a considerable extent the whole leadership realized, they were all loyal socialists. But once Mao was dead and they could look around them and see the rest of the world, they realized that with the world's best economic system, they had failed catastrophically badly. They were a dirt poor society. They'd done something wrong, they didn't know what, and Deng's view was therefore try lots of things uh, and see what works. And by Costa's account, most of the successes were not things that anybody planned. They were things that happened spontaneously that Deng had the sense not to suppress. And that was true of the essential privatizing of land ownership and agriculture. It was true of the growth of small firms in the cities and so forth. Uh, so that he's really arguing, I think, that we don't know enough to design institutions. And therefore, uh, a mechanism in which you're sort of blundering through trial and error, but being relatively willing to let things happen, uh, at least in that case, work better. Uh, mm. And sort of one of the really interesting things that people ought to be thinking about for the next century or so is the contrast between what happened to the Soviet Union and what happened to China. Because China was spectacularly successful from an economic standpoint. Soviet Union, not very. I mean, they're still basically a resource extraction uh, is, is, is seems to be the main source of revenue for the government uh, whereas the Coase's figure for China is that from Mao's death to 2010 real per capita income went up 20 fold wow uh, that's, that's uh, a lot so so why, why did one succeed so much you know one answer is that the uh, Russians tried to introduce both democracy and capitalism at the same time the Chinese didn't uh, another possible answer is that the Russians tried to do their, in theory, to do their capitalism on instructions from the West, whereas the Chinese sort of were inventing their own version as it went. I don't know what the answer is, but it's going to be a really interesting question because it's quite a striking difference. Oh, I think I remembered the question I wanted to ask you about the Holcomb debate was um, one of the counter arguments that you said was 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 a was a forceful one that you that you wrote a rebuttal to another article was if if uh, if these uh, systems these privatized systems are are effective historically we haven't really seen them and they tend to get conquered by 
He's that was that was actually, I, I probably raised that because of an exchange uh, with Nozick, uh, not a written exchange. Very long time ago, I gave a talk at a libertarian, I think it may have been even an LP convention or something, about Nozick's book, Out of Your State and Utopia, with Nozick in the audience, which was sort of fun. And we then had an exchange afterwards. And he did not try to support the argument he made in the book, but he offered what I thought was the strongest argument, which is why don't we observe modern stateless societies? Uh, and that's a, a serious argument. And my standard counter to that is to say, well, look, if, you, if it were 1700, and I was describing this crazy utopian system, roughly modern society, we have no examples of that. It's this, I mean, you want to look at a crazy system. Uh -huh. Not only do you have majority vote to term running the government, which is a pretty weird idea, yeah. uh, but even women can vote. And, and women have the same rights as men. I mean, no one's ever had a society like that. How could you imagine that? And furthermore, this is a society where the typical government spends 40% of national income. That's just horrendously high. Uh, maybe the Spartans did it, but it's, it's sort of not a normal thing. And yet that's now the norm. So things do change, and we don't have a very good understanding of what the variables are that make them change. I think, I think one thing that, one, that someone like Noza could raise as an objection to that counter argument is that the kinds of changes that you are describing in America that you just mentioned are social changes, so they are extreme and radical to somebody from the 17th century. Uh, but those aren't actually services being produced per se, those are ways society is organized. Um, and when we look at this, this the well, what, 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 even in a modern society, the means by which a pri the rules that govern private and public production of a service are pretty much constant. It's just that with technology, they're refined to be better or worse. I'm not sure I understand that. I would have said that it's not the technology that there, there that there are. There is a political market as well as a private market. Yes. The political market does not have the same tendency as the private market to give optimal results. And so sometimes the political market makes things worse by passing tariffs. It's just happening at the moment. Sometimes it makes them better. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I guess the question, maybe I should rephrase it a little more clearly, is is that when you're when you're the, the services that are being provided, so you're the, the, you're comparing services versus social norms. So, as you said, uh, the the private uh, le letting people try new ideas rather than you know stifling creativity, which is more of a public sector thing. So, in that sense, whatever the technology level, if you serve as parents, allow people to be more creative in solving problems, like in a market situation, mm -hmm. they're they're going to have overall better results yes. than than in a public sector where they are discouraged from being innovative. Now. It would be it's it's very odd that that normal because uh, that, that trend that we see we see it all around us where these private firms are more creative and or even as individuals are more creative at solving. But problems. you've seen the opposite trend as well that the restrictions on private activities in the U.S. are I would have said that on private economic activities are higher than they were a hundred years ago. Oh yeah, no, it goes in circles. But what I'm saying is, it would seem odd that the state would still maintain its more or less concurrent hegemony over this service. Um, if Cerebus Paradis, uh, it, they tend to be less creative and less efficient. The state continues to control, to, to, to have tariffs, despite the fact that the relevant economics were worked out 200 years ago. No, well, no, yeah. It's but, politically but, profitable. That, 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 that you've got to distinguish between what is politically profitable and what is economically profitable. And there are, that's what public choice theory is about, really, uh, that the fact that it is often in the interest of the state to do things which are not in the interest of the population it rules. Now, let me rephrase it. I think there's a subtle misunderstanding here. Is right. let's, let's have two armies squaring off against each other. And you, right. you even gave an example in your book. The two generals are roughly equal skill. But but the general that coming from a free society is is more adaptive because he's because it's rewarded in, in that society. But in my particular example, the generals from the less free society uh, also have the kind of culture in which they have studied the previous battles of my protagonist. Uh, his officers have not studied the previous battles of the other side. 
therefore, he's got to invent a new trick every every, every campaign, as it were, which eventually runs out. So that that in a sense, I'm cheating by having him being unusually talented. And even there, it's not clear he's going to win. Although, of course, since I'm writing it, I want him to win. He wins. He's got the ultimate superpower: is author control. Uh, but so, but if you think about politically, uh, we have tariffs. Mm -hmm. because of a predictable form of market failure on the political market, namely the fact that the interests of concentrated interest groups are more heavily weighted than the interests of dispersed interest groups. And that can result in outcomes that make everybody worse off, because everybody is a member, is a member of both dispersed and concentrated interest groups, and the, as a member of a concentrated interest group, you steal $10 at an expense of 20 and as a benefit member of his first, you pay 20 so somebody else can get 10. So it's not as if the mechanisms that give our governments have an automatic drive towards optimality, as far as I can tell. Yeah, I, I, well, I think let me, the, the objection is, is not that, why are they doing something that's inefficient? Because, of course, the government would have an incentive politically to do inefficient things. But what yeah. I'm saying is, if it is, is, if it is inefficient, as this particular model indicates, why is it still in charge and not been beaten by the private, more competitive uh, pri the security services? That, that's, I think, the objection I'm getting at. Yes, but of course I'm not arguing, I, I haven't argued at any point in this, that the private model does a better job of national defense. I've only argued that they do an adequate job okay. and that it does a better job of making people happy, healthy, oh, wealthy, sure. and so forth. I, I was just using that within the context of the knows it question that, that you were answering in that debate there. Or uh, that lecture you gave there. So it's within yeah. that within that context. Um, but I given given that modern societies are in some sense democratic, you don't have to win a war with the state. You just have to persuade the population more and more that fewer and fewer things should be done by the state. And with luck, eventually you end up um, with 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 essentially no state no state left. This is let me go back for a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people who defend the Second Amendment defended on what I was arguing was the 18th century round for doing so. Mm. I would say that that doesn't work nearly as well because of the increased specialization in military things, so that the advantage of the professionals is larger than it used to be. But that the equivalent of the Second Amendment in the modern society would be unregulated encryption, because the combats between the population and the state are going to be more largely information warfare rather than physical warfare. Unregulated encryption means that the state does not have a good way of controlling information flows among people. And if once everybody on the state's side is persuaded they're better off without a state, the state has no soldiers left. Yeah, I got, I got one example of, of how uh, a privatized society uh, could help defend itself. And I don't know if you've come across this before, but one of the things that's transformed modern warfare is the ever-present press. So war crimes and atrocities, like for instance, when we invaded the Philippines, or when the British uh, fought the Boers, you know, they'd run out of concentration camps, they'd shoot the kids, it was really, but nobody would know about it. You know, the newspaper was just getting started, but then you got May Lai in Vietnam, and everybody's outraged. And then you get in Iraq, we can't have a May Lai, it's just not possible. Now you could have a Abu Ghraib, which is bad, but not nearly as bad as may lie. And we see yeah. that with, with the ever-present transparency of a, of a omnipresent... I wonder how much, of, how much of that would be true in a war where you really felt threatened. Hmm. That, as I can't remember, I mean, I think it was pretty obvious in World War II that we were, in fact, deliberately bombing civilian targets. I mean, there's not much question when you drop a bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki that most of the people you're killing are not soldiers. Yeah. And yet, and yet, it seems to me that most of that stuff, or consider for a, a, a domestic case, uh -huh. there wasn't much opposition, as far as I can tell, in the internment of the Nice side during World War II. That was outrageous behavior by our oh, standards, yeah. and by, I think even by the standards that people would have held 15 years earlier. But once you start feeling as though we're threatened, I mean, they just attacked us in Hawaii and smashed our fleet, now you're a lot more willing to to, to swallow your moral concerns. Well, I think, like you said, it's it's not that any one solution works 100% all the time. Yep. But what we have seen is a correlation between uh, the kinds of things that, that governments or, or, or warlords get away with 
in the realm of atrocities and, and brutal heavy-handed tactics. It's harder, it's harder in, in terms of the domestic press, yes. So I would argue, even the international press, because even if it's like, say, Al Jazeera or BBC or, or Russia Today, mm -hmm. I, th I think one thing, if you were to write like a speculative fiction about how uh, this kind of private society would develop, you could see them uh, getting basically giving a preferential uh, treatment to all the international press outlets so that they would be there in their country reporting on everything that goes on. Yeah. One, One problem, problem you're going to have in terms of this, though, is that it's also getting easier and easier to have fake news. So you can easily end up, I mean, this is not new. If you think about World War I, you have anti-German propaganda, which was false. Yeah. One of the reasons, I think, that people were reluctant to believe in the concentration camps in World War II was they said, well, we've heard this story all right, you know, about all this raping of, of, of Belgian nuns and, yep. and making something or other out of human flesh. I don't remember what, what story. There was some kind of a story about human Baby, fat. Babies, you know. you know. There's a bunch of that stuff. And modern technology would also make it much easier to create fake atrocities. Well, the, well, we already know that, too, because the Soviets in the 1920s, I remember reading there was a massacre that they blamed on the whites, which had actually been perpetrated by Chinese warlords who crossed the border. But the mm -hmm. Soviets used those imagery, and then they, they, they doctored it a bit, and they yep. said these, these are white Russian soldiers committing the atrocity rather than bandits and outlaws in this sort of like no man's land that developed mm -hmm. during the Civil War. So we even see then that... Yeah, but I, but I would say I would say but that's going to be a problem in in controlling. There's going to be a real problem in controlling uh, atrocities by either side of a military conflict by publicity. Uh, once a fair number of the atrocities turn out to be false, mm -hmm. then the real ones you can always claim were false. You you can do that. I think what we can say conservatively though is that uh, the international news media does have some tendency in some cases, mm -hmm. and actually, at least currently a great many cases, but we can imagine exceptions, to lower the opportunity cost for a nation to engage in heavy-handed strategy because of the blowback of international opinion. I mean, maybe they might get attacked by another power because they're mm -hmm. like, this is so outrageous, you, you can't do this. You know, we'll, we'll intervene to stop you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like we could see, like, for instance, the stated reasons with Saddam. I mean, they, mm -hmm. they were the stated reasons, but even if they had happened, those atrocities, mm -hmm. that, that could happen. You know, somebody could say, yeah. oh, you can't do that. So that would raise the opportunity cost. It'd be one more consideration. All right. Well, anyway, interesting conversation. This is probably as long as anybody's going to want to watch on YouTube oh, anyway. Sure, definitely. So, but you should get, get a hold of Jeff Hummel and see if you can do something with him because that would be a different, yeah. a different take on the same set of issues. All right, so let me just uh, wrap this up then. Uh, thank sure. you very much, uh, David, for joining the stream. This is Todd Lewis of the Praise of Folly podcast, signing off.